Welcome to the Student Pilot Podcast. My name is Simon Callis, a flight school owner. Each week, myself and my guests will be talking all things flight training and beyond to help inspire, motivate and support you on your journey to becoming a private or commercial pilot. So welcome to the podcast, everybody. This week, we're talking about how to perfect your circuits. Good landing usually starts with a good circuit and approach. So let's focus on the areas leading up to a good landing. And this is what we call the instructor takeover. So this is a new feature on the podcast where I invite these lovely instructor type people onto the podcast to tell you stuff that you need to know. So Claire, welcome to the podcast. Hello. First thing is preparation, I think, isn't it? So know the circuit pattern. It so, really is. I mean... It's everything that you've learned in six minutes. So, yeah. you know, the key things for me are you need to understand what you're going into. Yeah. Um, understand you've got uh, here at Coventry, we've got a nice circuit diagram um, yeah. that the Coventry airport was kindly reproduced. So we see where we're going. You can have mm-hmm. a look at that, but also know all your procedures as well. Yeah. So and if you're not comfortable with some of those flight procedures that you've practiced previously, so if you're not quite getting your climbs right, you're not quite getting your yeah. descents with power and flap set up right. Go and nail them in the local area first yeah. because you do not have time to perfect them in the circuit. And the trim. And Just the trim. Don't forget the trim. One of the key areas that we see that students don't do, which I think is really important, is reading up first on the exercise. So in your flying book one, which is available from Pooleys and AFE and all the providers, isn't it? Yeah. There is a breakdown of each exercise with pictorial uh, diagrams, you know, text descriptions in there. So it's really important because it will take you through step by step the circuit before you come in for your actual uh, briefing with your instructor, which is... Uh, so I think obviously the first briefing in the circuit is fairly long, isn't it, when you're talking it through? Oh, it but... is. It can easily be 40, 50 minutes um, yeah. to go through all those little bits in detail. And... Um, you know, if, if you get yourself ahead of the game, have a look at it through the books, first of all, then, um, you know, you're coming yourself already partly prepared. prepared. Yeah, exactly. um, you then have that facility just to take on that little bit of extra knowledge that the instructor might want to impart, yeah. um, where the book Absolutely. might not quite have what we want, local procedures, etc. Yeah, and um, de- definitely in between your lessons, read up on it again. So yeah. that you're fully aware of it. Next thing is the airfield plates and diagram. We spoke about that earlier. There's one here um, on the wall. But you can find those on the AFE or Paulie's flight guides. Also usually available on airfield websites and things, isn't it? Yeah, they usually are. And um, particularly airfields that have um, specific noise abatement um, procedures and things like that. If they're noise sensitive areas and things, then obviously the, the circuits might not be specific and yeah. what we would call standard. Um, yeah. Some airfields have funny shaped circuits. So... You know, if, if you're even if you're doing your, your circuits mm. at home, you need to understand where you're going and, and to make that accurate. But it's actually really important to do that for yeah. all of your land away sites as well. Absolutely. And I think even knowing where all the holding points are and stuff like that on the ground uh, really helps when you're getting, you know, when they're giving you information and you're not sort of thinking, oh, God, where's that? And looking for Oh, exactly. You know, they're they're, where they're invaluable, the, the airfield plates and things. Absolutely. Okay, okay. Next thing is aircraft checklists and procedure one of the common things that people get stuck with is like checks isn't it when they're under pressure and all that kind of stuff so if you revise your checklist and, and acronyms in your checklist like bumfitch for example which anybody in the circuit will know is their downwind check or pre-landing check it's really good to be able to recall that wouldn't you say sort of at will oh, absolutely so um, i'm a great advocator of anything that's done on the ground use a checklist so you're not forgetting things but anything in the air you mm-hmm. should be trying to remember it yeah. So any checks done in the air, remember them. And then if you can't remember them, the yeah. checklist is there to make sure you can just quickly yeah. take a look and make sure that everything's covered. It's not there to um, actually take you through A, B, yeah. C, D. You don't have time for that in the circuit. No. Um, you know, that downwind leg is a minute what, at best. Yeah. Um, you know, by the time you found the right page in your checklist, it's a nightmare. Just remember it all. Take that time at home yeah. to sit there. Remember those mnemonics and things. And quite a lot of them are... Um, if you get some good ones, they're all rude. Of course, they're much easier to remember when exactly. they're rude. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I think that the key thing is that, you, is that there is more time than you give it credit for to start off with. I never forget flying downwind with my instructor. And I was all like, quick, do this, quick, do that. I've got to do this, quick, got to get the radio call and all that stuff. And they said, just chill out a minute. I'll demonstrate the next one. And it was like they had all the time in the world. And it's because they were just a lot more prepared. Yeah. So the yeah, preparation was... means that you do have that time to yeah. sit and relax downwind. And if you haven't prepared, yeah. um, like you clearly didn't on yours, Simon. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> no, seriously, um, the preparation gives you that time to just take it all in. 
Yeah. Um, if you haven't got that preparation, you really are running behind the aeroplane and you can't, yeah. you can't have that. You've got to be one step ahead of the aeroplane all the time. Exactly. Just to apologise to the listeners, we do have aeroplane noises in the background, but we are actually at an airfield. Hurrah! So, and ooh. we're flying, which is a great <laughs> weather day. Exactly. Next thing um, is um, having a look through the aircraft's POH. is understanding your V-speeds, VX, v, uh, VY, VFE, all those kind of things. So that if your instructor is saying, right, we need to do a VX climb out, you know what they're talking about, you know what the speed is. Um, and when you're setting up the aircraft, I think all of that stuff is really important to know. Yeah, I mean, um, to be honest, um, they should be cemented in at the time of teaching them. If you're doing yeah. a, a VX and VY climb, you're going to be doing those quite early on in your training. That, yeah. that should be the staple diet. But to go back and refresh on those just to make sure, again, it's part of that preparation that makes things so much easier yeah. when you get to fly it for real. Yeah, exactly. So next thing is radio calls. Everyone gets sort of afraid of doing the radio to start off with, but unfortunately when you're in the circuit, there's quite a bit of radio going on along with everything else. There is. Um, it's an interesting one. I, I personally like to introduce students uh, to the radio very, very early on, yeah. literally lessons two or three, I think. Here at yeah. Almat, we're, we're quite keen on doing that. And yeah. that takes away that nasty sort of feeling of, oh dear, I don't want to talk on the radio, it scares me. Yeah. You know, yeah. The person at the other end of that radio is just a normal human being. They have their own faults. We all make mistakes. And on a good day, we can all have a good laugh about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, introduction of RT... When just coming into the circuit, it's the wrong time. You need to have that basics there, really. Absolutely. Um, and, yeah, if you've got a crib sheet, we've got crib sheets here. We've mm. just introduced them at both of our bases, haven't we? It just yeah. makes it an awful lot easier. Um, it's interesting you say there's a lot of RT in the circuit. There is, but it's not always about you, and that's no, the no. important thing. Yeah. So you've only really got the downwind call to do yeah. and then the final call. Yeah. Um, so... For an individual point of view, you're just doing two calls every six minutes, and that's fine. But what the key thing is, is that you actually have to listen to what everybody else is doing. Yes. And you have to understand what they're telling you as yeah. well. Um, you have to, you know, for the most part, we don't have radar here or anything like that at Coventry Airport. We're completely reliant on position reports of other pilots telling us where they are, what height they are, what they're doing. Mm-hmm. We have to trust that that's accurate. Yeah. We have to provide accurate information in return so that we're not, you yes. know, leading people up. Uh, the wrong path effectively yeah. and that again it comes down to crib sheets to help you out learning uh, the correct rt from the cat 413 yeah. which is you know a massive document but it's got everything in it and it's the go-to document to, to to make sure that we all keep safe and accurate and and legal yeah and i think that's why it's really important as well that like you just touched on there is the radio calls you're relying on other people's stuff to be accurate absolutely so that you can gauge where they're likely to be now if they're if they're unaware of their position or they say it's somewhere that it's not, which people do sometimes. They'll say, oh, I'm late downwind and they're turning base or whatever. It's you're looking for somebody in the wrong place. Yeah. So, so. the classic one here is um, people will call, uh, they're on a, a left base or a right base um, to land um, mm. and they've not got there yet. Um, yeah. They're on an extended base leg, which is two or three miles out and they've called yeah. it early and, and nobody knows where it is. And that, yeah. that could be quite hard. So, yeah. you know, you need to understand it goes back to that original, know where the circuit is. Mm-hmm. Don't call until you're actually there. Yeah. Um, because it doesn't help anybody you no. know um you might be given a number one to land when actually you're probably going to be like number two or three because mm. the circuit traffic is is ahead of you but you just don't realize it yeah absolutely and i think the back to the cap 413 as well the accuracy of the calls is really really important we had a student um who was with flying with will actually recently and will said he was paraphrasing the calls to get him started on the radio and he said um to report lined up two three ready departure and he said lined up two three ready takeoff oh you can't say yeah, that exactly so, no takeoff is only given as a as a cleared for takeoff and that's it yeah, yeah exactly so it's really really important to use the correct phraseology um also so next thing is good foundation of flying skills so like you touched on earlier on if you are rusty at trimming if you're rusty at um, you know, speed control in general, or just any of the general principles that you would have learned earlier on, it's all going to compound in the circuit. <laughs> I think you have to go back to the fundamentals. Why is the circuit there? The circuit mm. is there so that we can learn and practice landings. Yeah. yeah. So we start off not being able to land at all yeah. and we have to end up being proficient at landing. It's one mm-hmm. of the hardest things as a pilot that we have to try and control. Mm-hmm. Um, slow airspeed, difficult weather conditions and things all compound that, that whole approach and landing phase. Yeah. Now, the only way we're going to get good at that is through practice. And the circuit was designed so that we get as much practice as we can yeah. 
in our hour, hour and a half, our two hour slot, whatever it is we're going to do. So it's not there for us to practice climbing, descending, flying straight and level. We need to know all of those things already because otherwise you're not going to be able to practice those landings because you're still messing around trying to do all the other stuff that really you should have had already. So you've just got to have all of those fundamental basics in the box already so that you can then just apply them and then you can focus all of your energies on the learning to land bit which is what the circuit is for so key points then to make it easy for you and these are all ones that will came up with the other day actually when we were talking about it so the first one is trim for the correct speed for each stage of the circuit that's going to result in minimum inputs on in terms of pitch and it's going to vastly reduce your workload Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, So for me, I find a lot of people chasing instruments. Um, Number one, know your pitch attitudes. Look look at the outside the window, learn and make sure you understand where the nose should sit for each of the phases of flight. Nose up for the climb, obviously the position, your datum attitude for straight and level, the correct pitch attitude for the descents, and then trim it so that it stays there. And that is absolutely key. You know, the, the attitude plus the, the, the power and the performance, get it trimmed out and it will, it will give you the performance that you need. It will give mm. you that correct speed. Yep, um, exactly. And the trimming will, will maintain it. You can let go of the aeroplane, it will fly itself. So number two was focus on flying a good circuit initially rather than focusing on the end result, which is the landing. I, I think that's great advice, Will, to be honest. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, uh, part of the circuit is the go-around. So yeah. why not learn the go-arounds, first of all, whilst yeah. you're learning the actual pattern of the circuit? Absolutely. Um, you can then have more capacity to understand what the wind is doing to you. Yeah. Is it drifting you left and right of where your intended track is going to be? Is it going to make your downwind leg longer or shorter or quicker or, you know, all those sorts of things? Mm-hmm. Um, you don't have to introduce the landing straight away no. um, at all. And the go-around is just as important as a landing is anyway. So um, I would agree with that, absolutely. Number three was always consider the wind and make appropriate corrections. Well, we already we started to allude on it. Yeah, so. absolutely. Absolutely. You, the, the wind plays havoc with the yeah. circuit if you're not paying attention to it, particularly strong, challenging, gusty, windy days. Um, yeah. You know, it might be a nice straight headwind on the runway, but as soon as you turn crosswind, yeah. that's going to compound your downwind and everything else if you're not yeah. making allowances for it. Absolutely. And I think, that, like you said, the key thing is what it, how it affects your leg. So if you're trying to track a particular track and you've adjusted for it, if you don't, that might reduce your um your base leg for example so you're closer into the runway then you've got less time to there do, is nothing yeah. worse than having no exactly. base leg to yeah, do yeah. anything with and all of a sudden <laughs> you've overshot and you're facing yeah. the wrong way on the runway it's just a mess too so, fast not configured all that stuff absolutely yeah <laughs> the, the, the wind you know it's it's a major feature of, of everything that we do isn't it but absolutely. no more so than than in the circuit next thing is don't use features to navigate the circuit so the one feature that every airfield has unless you're in the wrong place, is a runway. (laughs) Most of my students are aware that um, I teach them to use the airframe, actually. Mm. So when you turn um, onto, obviously you would climb to maybe 500 feet, or depending on your your local requirements. Here it's 500 feet before the ground, before we then Mm -hmm. start to turn crosswind. But then that position to turn downwind, use your aeroplane. If the extended centre line of the runway goes underneath the tailplane, turn downwind. Mm -hmm. That should put the runway running along your wingtip, which puts you in a grand position for then keeping that nice and parallel downwind yep. base leg 45 degrees behind the trailing edge of the wing yep. um so you know seven or eight o'clock position if you're using uh, a clock code for example and that means that you can fly any standard circuit pattern mm. anywhere including a desert you don't need features on the ground to help you they are helpful there's no doubt about it yeah but don't feature crawl because that's not going to help you at all thing is also if you get into a really low vis situation you might not be able to see those exactly things. and so. all of a sudden those happy creature comforts are gone yeah and you've got to rely and go back to the basics exactly. um, absolutely so next thing is set the aircraft up early on each leg this allows you more time especially on base leg like we just spoke about there's nothing worse than being well behind the aircraft on base leg so configure it early buys you more time to set up for a decent stable approach absolutely yeah i I see a lot of things it depends on how you're taught and again it depends a little bit on aircraft type as well um but i have seen people just add one stage of flap until they get halfway down base leg and then they'll add a second stage of flap a bit later and it's it's like reconfigured then reconfigured then reconfigured then reconfigured and you haven't got time to then think well actually what are all these reconfigurations actually doing and am i in the right place and oh crikey now i'm there and i'm not um you could have done all of that right at the start of the base leg 
put whatever flap heads you need, do it there straight away, set the power, and then you've got the time to assess, make adjustments appropriately um, to give yourself the accuracy that um, you need. When you're at water airfields and things like that, if, if you're in a quicker aeroplane, you might want to configure late downwind, for example, so that you've got time to you know, to get yourself in. Absolutely, early. yeah. Um, so it's all a judgment, you know. It's It also depends on other circuit traffic. So, yeah. you know, not everybody flies the same speed as you. If you're in yeah. a nice um, Cherokee doing 100 knots, um, you might be joining an airfield that has a microlight that's only doing 50 or 60. Yeah. Um, so you might need to configure downwind to slow up. Yeah, exactly. Because otherwise you're going to become far too close to each other. There's an air prox, um, you know, risk, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah. it's all about, um, you have to adapt to the, the environment around you, but also that don't be afraid to set up early. If, uh, just situation just awareness, isn't yeah. it? Really, Absolutely. that's the key. So final approach then. So there's a load of things on final approach. So have a good understanding of pitch and power. So we teach pitch for speed and power for rate of descent. So if it's too fast, uh, we can uh, raise the nose slightly. If it's too slow, we can lower the nose slightly and obviously trim for it. It's amazing people, when they're under pressure, they forget this stuff, the basics. They do, but also you have to bear in mind that if you've set the aeroplane up on base leg appropriately, mm -hmm. um, what I'm also seeing is a lot of over pitching and, yeah. and, and things. And you don't need to actually yeah. keep the runway in a constant position in the windscreen and those pitch changes to get the speeds that you need are actually quite small. They're going to be, you know, a centimetre above and below what you just yeah. started off with. They don't need to be massive, great big changes, um, which only really occurs if you haven't got the aeroplane configured and trimmed properly back on base leg. So, yes, you know, yeah. we do have to make these changes and they're, they're small all the time. They don't, they don't just, the aeroplane doesn't just sit and fly itself down there unless you've got a nil wind day, really. You're going to have mm. to encounter you know all the turbulence and and, and buffet and things that comes along with the um, flying at low altitudes and things but it's small changes but again be ahead of the airplane expect yeah. those things i think remember that you have got a trimmer right you don't have to necessarily adjust the pitch with your hand if it's a small adjustment you could just tweak the trim a little bit it's a wee usually, bit yeah it's I mean, usually enough isn't it you, so. normally if you've trimmed it on base leg you shouldn't really need to touch it mm -hmm. too much um unless you've got significant changes in the weather which do require a complete trim mm. change again if you're adding a, a third or a fourth stage of flap or whatever it is yeah. on final approach then of course the, the, there's a trim change required as a result of that but um the key thing is less work is better <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yes so assess the picture out the window to ensure you're on the correct approach path not too high not too low you're on the center line so have an appreciation for the wind direction as well um and, you know, if you're struggling to get the picture right, get your instructor to demonstrate it to Absolutely. you. Absolutely. So uh, you, you mentioned there, have an idea of what the wind is like. When you turn on to final approach, that's the ideal time to have a look at the windsock. Yeah. You know, listen out to the RT. We've just discussed RT. When they give you your clearance to land or your land at your discretion or your nothing known to affect, depending on what airfield you're at, they will always provide you with a wind reading. Yeah. Um, so speed, direction, it's all in there. Mm -hmm. That just gives you that idea of where the wind is coming from, what it's going to do to you. And even if you had none of that available, actually, if you're focused correctly on keeping the aeroplane on the correct um, track coming in, yeah. you can see that you're already crabbing into the wind to get yeah. that adjustment already sorted. So, yeah. So okay. next thing is have an aiming point. Yeah, you so know. typically you've got, um, for somewhere that doesn't have um, an instrument approach procedure, you'd be looking at maybe the numbers. Yeah. Um, if it was a farm strip, you'd be looking at maybe a quarter to one third down the runway length, depending on the length of the runway. Yeah. For somewhere with an instrument approach procedure, um, like we used to have at Coventry, obviously the markings are still on the on the tarmac here, but mm. Gloucester, Cranfield and things, they've got a touchdown zone yeah. where your pappy lights and things will lead you right down to the touchdown zone. And you can, you can make that your aiming point. It doesn't really matter which one it is, just yeah. choose one. Keep it nice and fixed in the windscreen and that will keep you yeah. on the correct path. So next thing is um, ensure the aircraft is trimmed properly in order you're able to fly accurate speed on the descent. Always be prepared to readjust the trim if the speed is out. Yeah. I think we did that one, didn't we? We have kind of, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just reiterating that on final approach, it's a fluid environment. Yeah. So you, you, can't, you can't really just set it and leave it. Most of the time you can on the whole, but there are going to be adjustments that are going to be required. Yeah. You know, when we say adjust it and leave it, most part, if you can get that trim for the speed set up on base leg, that means that the speed shouldn't really change. Mm. But because the wind has the effect and the other bits and, um, and pieces come into play as well, you're then in a situation where you do have to make adjustments to your pitch and your power to get yourself back onto an approach path because you will have drifted off slightly. Yeah. Um, and you might then need to retrim as appropriate. But yeah, be prepared to do it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
And the other thing which people don't really appreciate so much until they start flying the circuit is how much the aircraft does move around at lower levels and kind of not to get fixated about trying to correct every little thing the airplane's doing because you're no, just the, wearing yourself out. Yeah, the airplane flies beautifully. Um, yeah. You know, yes, it's going to get a little bit bumped around and things. And, and the lower you go, yes, the more turbulence you're going to experience. Um, some days more than others, of course. Um, and you've got environmental factors like roundabouts, as we have on the approach to 2-3 here, yeah. trees and, and woodland and things. But ultimately, again, it will bounce it around but not massively. It's yeah. not going to take a bounce and bounce you half a mile off track. No, it's no. just going to be just a small couple of feet here and there, um, which actually might settle down by itself. You don't need to go manhandling it, um, yeah. you know, to, to, to sort of just be calm and gentle about it. It'll, it'll work itself out um, with small movements. That's it. That's the thing, isn't it? Just let it move around a bit underneath you and don't stress too much about it. As long it, as you're so. on the correct uh, flight path and things, it'll sort yeah. itself out. So next thing, this is, I think this is probably the most important out of everything, is no one to go around. So there are so many reasons you might choose to go around. It could be a gust, you could be too high, too fast, too slow. Whatever the reason, you know, I think we need to really be clear that going around is sometimes the safest option. Oh, absolutely. So yeah. I, I always try and instill a, a go-around point. So you mm. get to a point on your approach, whether it be 100 feet above the ground, 200 feet, whatever it is. Mm. Um, so I have my own limits. The school has it and, and, and others will, will say differently. So that's, that's irrelevant. But you, you have a point at which you say, right, I've reached this altitude. Mm -hmm. Am I now safe to continue? Mm -hmm. And if not, I'm going to go around. Yeah. And that's it. Now, sometimes you might say that you need to continue, but you get further down and then a gust of wind puts you off yeah. and then you would go around anyway. Yeah. But it's nice to have that point there because then you're thinking about it. Yeah. And that's the key thing is have that go around in mind. Don't just think I'm going to land, I'm going to land, I'm going to land, because that can again lead you into a dangerous situation if you've yeah. not thought about all the potential outcomes. Commercial level, they're teaching uh, stable approach criteria and things. We don't really teach that as part of PPL, but what you're saying is have a discipline. Yeah. For it and yeah and to it, be honest we 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 don't label it stable yeah, approach we, we, but we we, we are mm. producing stable approaches by yeah. keeping you know that that approach that aiming point fixed in the windscreen you've yeah. got small corrective maneuvers and things to keep it nice and um mm. exactly on the flight path that you want so effectively we are teaching a stable approach we just haven't labeled it yeah exactly i think the biggest thing really is the speed isn't it people sometimes come in at terrifyingly fast speeds and don't sort of recognize it too fast is not good and too slow is not good yeah. either so. you're in that situation where you need enough speed to give you good controllability with your ailerons elevators rudders etc but you don't want to be too fast so yeah. that the thing doesn't want to land and yeah. it will float and float and float if yeah. you get that speed wrong so you've got to have enough speed to keep it safe but not so much that you're not going to get it down with the parameter within the parameters that you've planned. You've planned that you've, you know, the runway is long enough for me to land. Well, yeah, it only is if you stick to the, the book speeds. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that that's the key, really, isn't it? Is learn the book speeds. Oh, absolutely. And fly them. Yeah, I mean, the, the, know, uh, ultimately, we have to teach you to go within the the realms of the PPL skills test. You know, mm -hmm. there's a standards document um, 19 which. Uh, applicants can read the, the um, guidance for applicants taking the skills test and at the back of that it's got all of the parameters for pass or fail so you mm. have to be I think it's plus 10 minus 5 for, for takeoff plus 10 minus 5 I think for landing I can't remember off the top of my head mm. but they're all in there yeah that's that's it if you're outside of those limits yeah. you're not going to get a pass that day because no. that's not safe and like you said about you know you take a let's talk 172 specifically because they're the, the worst for float if you like yeah you know if you fly a 172 even five knots above the recommended approach speed it just eats up a lot more runway than you anticipate yeah it really so, does obviously the end result the one thing that is inevitable at some point you're going to land the landing technique it does vary from aircraft to aircraft so we're not going to discuss this in detail as it's very subjective and like we said it's specific to aircraft but the key points are is it's a three phase process i think people sort of think of this landing as like one thing it's three phases so we've got the descent we've got the round out and then we've got the flare um flare and hold off exactly yeah. um so if you've set your approach up then that next stage is going to come reasonably easy and then once you get to that whole point it was well where do we round out? So I yeah. know that a lot of people teach maybe 10 to 12 feet above the runway. For me, I find that could be quite difficult to judge. Mm -hmm. um, so again, something that I teach my students or if, if they're struggling is have a look at where the horizon sits. And when it starts to come up to where yeah. your cheekbones are, yeah. start to level out there. Yeah. Uh, and as you're coming in, 
That then gives you that ability. And by looking far, far down the end of the runway, you've got a far better appreciation of where you are in terms of altitude yeah. because you're using all your peripheral vision and, and things. Yeah. Don't just stare at the end of the nose of the aeroplane because you'll suddenly get this horrible ground rush. Yeah, um, it's horrible, isn't it? <laughs> oh, it's not very nice. It's not very nice. So you, you yeah. need to look at the big picture. Um, so you're flying initially on your approach. You're aiming at that aiming point. But then as you then getting over the runway... Um, you need to open up and broaden that viewing yeah. like using the peripheral vision, looking far down the end of the runway. And that gives you a much better idea. And you can start to then assess as the runway starts to fill the windscreen. Yeah. You're then into the next stage of mm-hmm. the flare and the holding off the aeroplane um, just above the runway um, until it settles down by its own accord, really. Yeah. Um, it's um, it's not easy, and that's why no. we do quite a lot of circuits. I think people also think that um, in the early stages we do exercise 4.1 and the next lesson we do 4.2, and, and every lesson it's, oh, we learn something new, we tick the box and we move yeah. on. No. And you get to circuits, and I think people almost think that, oh, we'll do exercise 12 and 13 this week, and then next lesson I'm going to do exercise 14. No, yeah. you're not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It takes a long time to learn all of those things. Yeah. And there's nothing in the aeroplane that's going to give you that accuracy other than your own eyes. And it takes time for a person, individual, each individual is different to just understand those little small changes Mm. and just appreciating them and getting to grips with them. And I think that's probably the most frustrating thing is that this particular thing we're describing now when this depth perception and everything else cannot be taught to you as such. No, it can be demonstrated through the instructor. um, And then the instructor you know, um, if you've got most of those things held off nicely, they quite often you'll find that the instructor may talk to you briefly as you're coming into that and holding off. We, we don't tend to like talking to people under a high stress environment. Yeah. We like people to just get on and do. But by the same token, if you've just flared a little bit high, we might tell you just, you know, just to yeah. hold it there a little bit and then fare a little bit more as the aeroplane sinks a little further. Or if it's gone horribly wrong, we might tell you to go round yeah. and that sort of thing. Um, but it's, what I meant by that is it's the it's kind of thing that, your instructor would be like, oh, hold it off, hold it off, and all this stuff. And you'd be like, Rrr. and then one day it would go, ah, now I understand yeah, what they mean. Yeah, it's the eureka yeah. moment. All of a sudden yeah. it clicks, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. And I think that's this is the point in the training where people first start thinking about giving up, I think. Oh, it could be very frustrating for people, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I found circuits quite difficult. Um, yeah. I remember my instructor when I was doing my PPO years ago, um, took me out of the aeroplane and stood me on a mound at the side of the runway and we watched other aeroplanes landing. Yeah. Um, and he explained to me at the time what was going on, what phase it was, and this is this, and see how high they are, and this is what they're doing here, Claire. And I found that really helpful. The yeah. next lesson I came in um, and I flew much better. Yeah. Um, I also changed my footwear. I was wearing heels at the time. Not great. Naughty, <laughs> Ladies naughty. Don't, don't, well, anyone really, don't, don't wear heels. <laughs> I never wear my heels in an aeroplane. <laughs> um, oh. But ultimately, it was the demonstration outside of the, the cockpit I found just as useful as, as the demonstrations yeah. inside, as it turned out. It's funny. I remember um, always landing a bit flat and my instructor saying to me, right, accelerate down the runway, get the nose off, pull the power, and I want you to hold the nose on the horizon. So it's kind of wheeling down the runway almost, but yeah. it kind of got it into me a bit as to what the picture was. Yeah, was... I used to do that, or I, I have been known to do that downwind. If people are not, if they've not got the nose high enough to keep that nose wheel off the ground, then yeah. I set it up into 65 knots downwind and just to show them, you know, the horizon's disappeared here and yeah. the nose is very high. This is, you know, pretty much where we want to be yeah. just before we touch down on the runway. So next thing was, past where you sort of get all the wheels on the ground, you sort of let go of everything, like your job's done. It's not done at all. It's not done until you know? the aeroplane stops. <laughs> exactly. Um, and that's that's actually quite a key thing. A lot yeah. of people, it's almost like, oh, thank goodness I've done it. And they just relax. Yeah. You're like, no, 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 no. You've yeah. done it when it stops. You've just got to keep that nose wheel just off the ground a little bit. Um, you know, re- remembering to, to keep steering the aeroplane. You know, yep. Maintain the center line with your feet. And if there's a crosswind, into an aileron so you're not getting weather cocked on the runway as well. Exactly. As we said, said earlier, the aeroplane has still got a lot of energy in those wings it's yeah. until it goes below the stall speed um yeah. those wings will still want to fly um so you've got to make sure that the airplane is settled properly and that yeah. you're controlling it right to the point at which it can't do anything for itself given um, half the chance e- even on the, the the taxiway really is if you, you, you can weather cock on the taxiway if it's a strong one. yep so years ago a... i nearly lost control of a twin doing that <laughs> big and hill um it was really really windy the yeah. twin i was flying had a massive tail on it yeah. Ver- the vertical stabilizer was was really really big it was early stages of my multi-engine rating and it was a downhill slope with a sharp right angle bend at the end before we got to the air, um to the the whole point for the runway yeah. um and the wind blew the aeroplane off and I nearly ended up in the grass. Um, okay. The instructor caught it and it's, it's so easily done. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Particularly 
when you're new in early stages of the circuits and things, and you're yep. still you're still learning this aeroplane. Of course, you're learning yep. all the way through the PPL, um, and it can catch you off guard in the on the taxiways and things as well. Certainly, I think the last thing which people forget about as well is braking, because especially here, like at Coventry, you've got zero five approach Bravo. People, you know, they always say exit Bravo, and and it's like, look, yeah, that yes, if you can stop. Right, but uh, people get obsessed with jamming on the brakes and skidding yeah, and all this there's, stuff. There's so many things that are wrong with slamming on the brakes. Yeah. Um, it's one of my pet hates. Um, you know, not only are you doing the aeroplane, no help at all. You're, you're wearing through brake pads, wearing through discs. Um, you're putting yourself at risk. If you're yeah. slamming on the brakes at high speed, you can. It's a very high possibility you can lose control of it. Yeah. Um, you've got a lot of force going on the nose wheel. It can give it um, nose wheel shimmy and things, which is a very mm-hmm. violent manoeuvre and very unpleasant to deal with. Um, but skidding again yeah. absolutely it's only got to be a bit wet out there and uh, or a little bit slippery we're coming into winter flying now so all those sorts of things you've got to get the airplane under control and that means at a safe and sensible speed yeah. and i think the last thing with the braking is aerodynamic braking so if you hold the elevate the elevator fully aft it gives you a lot of aerodynamic braking yes it so, does um so yeah, don't wear the brakes out and just use the control. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> anyway, I hope everybody found this useful anyway. So it's not, you know, a, a lesson about circuits so much. It's just little tips and things, how you could make your circuit better. And ultimately, it's going to improve your landings if a circuit's better. So a good landing always starts generally with a good circuit, doesn't Absolutely, it? Absolutely, yeah. So, well, so I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And Claire, thank you very much for coming on and being part of the Instructor Takeover. Please like and subscribe to the podcast. Ding the bell to get notifications of more episodes. It really helps us to grow the channel and put more content out like this. See you later. If you like this episode, please like, subscribe and ding the bell to receive notifications of the next episode.